السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him upon all conditions We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his household, his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all May he bless every one of us May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness in this dunya as well as the next, Amin. My beloved brothers and sisters, sometimes when the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, it doesn't look initially like it is victory. If you take a look at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was something known as the great boycott. That boycott was in the Meccan period when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Mecca al mukarramah and the Meccans decided that we want to blockade the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all those who have accepted Islam. We want to blockade them in a way that they will be forced to do what we want them to do. Not realizing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was innocent. He was not guilty of any crime. All he was doing is calling people towards the truth, acknowledging the presence and the greatness and the worship alone of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala calling towards it, telling people to quit their bad ways and habits, giving people an opportunity to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was the message of Islam. Because they feared losing their power, they feared losing their authority, their wealth, they were simply jealous of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the mu'mineen. They could not stomach that someone else would probably take over from them and therefore they decided to boycott. At that stage, the Mu'mineen struggled for several years. In fact, according to some narrations, it lasted almost three years. They were in a place known as Shi'ab Abi Talib. And in this particular place, no one was allowed to talk to them. No one was allowed to deal with them, bring them food. Nothing was supposed to come in. Nothing was supposed to go out. And they struggled. So much so that they used to eat the leaves of the tree, but they did not give up their struggle. As a result, after several years, Allah gave them victory. The same people, the same people who were blockaded, who had been placed in a certain position of difficulty because of their perseverance, after some time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them victory. With us, we struggle, we suffer. A day, two days, a year, two years. And we think, you know, the help of Allah is not coming. To the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the help came. And it would have come if Allah wanted right at the beginning. But in order to distinguish from those who were believing truthfully and those who were false in their belief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept it enduring for a certain period of time. And thereafter, he gave them victory. Now, the reason I make mention of this is in our lives, we go through much difficulty. We go through problems. We go through issues. My brothers and sisters, be patient. Be patient and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant you victory. I'lam. You need to know that victory comes to he who is the most patient. It comes with patience. If you are patient, you will be victorious. If you've given up, that's the very moment that you actually have lost. So in Surah Al-Fatih, which is named after the victory of Mecca, the theme rotates around Hudaybiyah. What was Hudaybiyah? The Muslims decided we want to go the Muslims decided that we want to go and fulfill Umrah. So as a result of that, they decided we're not taking any arms. We are not going to be fighting. We are going to Mecca. We want to put on the Ihram. The Meccans are inside Mecca. We are in Medina. We are at war with them, but that's a holy, sacred place. We will go. They decided to proceed. They proceeded perhaps 1,400, 1,500 of them. And as they got to Mecca al Mukarramah, the surroundings, there was a place known as Hudaybiyah. They camped and they sent a delegation in to say, listen, we are here for this particular purpose. There was rumor that the man who had gone in with the discussion, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, someone spread a rumor that the Meccans had killed him. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very upset. And he said, look, we are people who've come without weapons. We didn't come here to fight. But... If that is true, we are ready to go and fight in order, in order to revenge the death of one of us. So all of them pledged allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ that we will do as you say. If you say we go, we go in. Whatever you say, we will do. We'll give up our lives for what is just and what is true. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved that pledge so much, he became pleased with them. You take a look at verse number 18 of Surah Al-Fatih, which is Surah number 48 of the Quran. Allah says, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايِعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ Indeed, Allah is pleased with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with those who pledged the allegiance to you under the tree. There is a huge tree in Hudaybiyah under which this pledge happened. So Allah says, Allah is pleased with you. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ speaks about how these blessed companions, they have a place in Jannatul Firdaus, including the 313 who had fought in the Battle of Badr before. The Prophet ﷺ says, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ اطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَدْرِ فَقَالْ اِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَإِنِّي قَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ you don't know, perhaps, Allah has looked at the hearts of those who participated in the battle of Badr and he has actually forgiven them. He has become pleased with them, subhanallah. This is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, it's important for us to note that when Allah is pleased with you, he will grant you victory. At that stage, the, the kuffar of Quraysh came out. And what they actually did is, when they came, they decided they want to, they decided that they would like to strike an agreement with the Muslims. The issue was to do with the discussion between the Kuffar of Quraysh and the Meccans. Uh, sorry, the, the, the Meccans who were the Kuffar of Quraysh and the believers. They came and told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, We'll strike a deal with you. We won't fight for 10 years. And we will do this. And we will do that. They decided all the points were for them and against the Muslims. I'm not going to go through the details because I don't want to talk in detail about the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. But trust me, if you looked at the points, all of them seemed like the Muslims were at a loss because they seemed very unfair. But the Prophet ﷺ decided to agree. The Prophet ﷺ decided to take it up and as he took it up and he agreed, they were now departing that area without the Umrah. In Ihram, they were now going back, subhanAllah, having compensated for that Ihram without the Umrah. And Allah revealed verses. Inna fatahna laka mubina. Indeed, we have granted you an open victory, a clear-cut victory. For you and the sahaba radiallahu anhum were shocked we've just lost now we couldn't go for umrah we just decided to agree on conditions that we weren't really too happy with had it not been for the prophet sallallahu we would probably have disagreed but because it was from the prophet sallallahu we decided to remain mum and we agreed with it now we are coming and allah says this is victory so some of the companions including umar ibn khattab radiallahu anh, it's reported that they asked a question afathun who is this actually victory and so subhanallah the Prophet ﷺ said, indeed it is a victory. What happened? There was a moment of silence. The war had stopped for a period of not more than one and a half, two years. And in that period of time, the message of Islam spread far and wide. Subhanallah. It spread far and wide. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the Muslimin because the kuffar broke that treaty. So later on when the Muslims were in a position of strength and the treaty was broken, they marched on to Makkah al-Mukarramah victorious. A few years later, they were the ones who had absolute control of Makkah al-Mukarramah. Subhanallah. Imagine it was the barakah of being humble. The barakah of being close to Allah. Brothers and sisters, when you and I face difficulty and hardship, remember, if you are close to Allah, that is nothing. Allah will recompense in the dunya and the akhirah for what you've been through. He will grant you. He will give you. Just bear patience. Save yourselves the tension and the depression and the ill health as a result of the worry. Don't, don't worry. Hand it over to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of it. You develop your relationship with Allah, nothing will go wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. This evening, I'd like to speak of the highlights of this entire series. For me, it is Surah Al-Hujurat. 
Surah number 49 of the Quran. I call on every one of you to pick up the Quran tonight. Surah 49. Open it and read the translation of Surah Al-Hujurat from the beginning to the end. Adopt it, follow it, your life will change. I promise you. For me, it is the ultimate highlight of this particular series known as Save Yourself. Save yourselves. Listen to what Allah says. It starts off mentioning etiquette, how to live your life, how to get along with people. How do you want to have the best life? Subhanallah. Listen to what Allah says. Allah starts off by warning us about raising the voice. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawti nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, it is an instruction for the Sahaba but it is an instruction and a lesson for all of us to know the volume when we are speaking who you are talking to and how you should be speaking remember when you raise your voice you lose respect people will not respect you why are you shouting why are you screaming for what reason have you raised your voice do not do that learn to speak in the correct volume and wallahi you will earn the respect of people imagine this is talking about the volume in other places of the Quran, Allah speaks about what exactly you should say. Even in this particular surah. Let's move to the next point. That was verse number two of the surah. Verse number six of the surah, Allah warns us about believing that which we hear or see without authenticating it. Isn't that a major disaster today? Nowadays we have videos, we watch them, we can actually see them and it's a lie. It didn't exist. It didn't even happen. It's perhaps a voice over, video shop, etc, etc. And we believe it. Subhanallah. Be very, very careful. Even what you see in mainstream news channels can actually be fabricated. And it can actually be wrong news. It can be something wrong. I recall watching news on a channel that people would never think would peddle lies. And they had footage of some story that was a long time back and they sold it as though it was a current affair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and protect us. And we, members of the public, we are swayed from side to side, believing this and that, becoming enemies of one another based on fabrication, based on tale. If shaitan wants to create enmity between us, he makes us believe something that is not reality, my brothers and sisters. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who can authenticate at all times. Find out. Make sure you find out again and again. If you hear something, make sure you find out. This is in Surah Al-Hujurat. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in jaakum fasikum binaba'in fatabayyanu an tusibu qawman bijahalah fatusbihu ala ma fa'altum nadimeen. O you who believe, if a person were to come to you with a tale about someone else, by virtue of coming with that tale, he is sinful. Therefore, you authenticate well before you believe that story because you will harm people without knowledge and you will become regretful of what you have done. Now there is another interpretation of it to say, if a sinful person comes to you with news, then authenticate it. But I prefer the tafsir that says, if a person comes to you with a tale, he's already sinful. Therefore, authenticate everything that comes to you. Make sure, because the minute I come to you with a negative story about someone else, aren't I backbiting? That makes me sinful, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. So this is a very powerful point. Then, obviously, we will have disputes amongst ourselves. We have disputes every day in the family, perhaps in the community, perhaps in the ummah at large. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this. And Allah says, when two groups from amongst you are fighting, make peace between them. Don't become happy. Yes, they're fighting. It's about time. They're going to hit each other. That's it. It's a good thing, you know. That's how some Muslims look at problems. But Allah says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ قُتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا If you find two groups of mu'mineen or muslimin fighting each other, make peace between them. And if one of them does not want to make peace, then you fight the one who is wrong until they come to the straight path back to what was right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to stand firm for justice. I want to address one point. When we have a problem in society, community, in the family, a lot of people make a statement that, you know what, I'm neutral. 
I am neutral. I want to teach you something. You can only be neutral for as long as you do not know both sides of the story. Once you know both sides of the story, it is wrong for you to remain hypocritical on the fence. You need to know this one was right, this one was wrong. That's it. And you need to let them know. Because if we keep on saying, I'm neutral, I'm neutral in all our problems. You see a thief stealing. Hey, guys, I'm neutral. That's it. You know, you see someone murdering another. I'm neutral. You see another crime happening. I'm neutral. What is this business of using neutrality to cover up hypocrisy? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. You remain neutral. We will be neutral before we know both sides. You hear one side, you are still neutral. You hear the other side, you have to take the side of what is right, wrong. Unless you don't understand. If you don't know and you are confused yourself, you can say, look, I'm confused. I don't want to get involved because I don't understand it. That, that is there. So let's remember this. The issue of neutrality was challenged even at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The hypocrites used it to con some of the people to come back from the battle of Uhud. Because they said, no, 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 we can't be fighting. Let's go back. These people, it's their war. We don't know, you know, why are they fighting? And they went away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a beautiful lesson. And this is why verse number 10, Allah says, You mu'mineen, you are all brothers and sisters in faith. So therefore, make amends, resolve your matters. Don't create bigger problems. Allah says, indeed, the mu'mineen are all brothers. So resolve the dispute between the two of you who are brothers who are actually quarreling with one another. And Allah says, fear Allah so that you can achieve his mercy. You want to achieve the mercy of Allah? Fear Allah when you are an arbitrator. A lot of the times when there is a powerful person and a weak person, the powerful person is wrong if the powerful person was wrong and the weak person was right. The general public goes to the weak person and says, never mind, it's okay, forgive him. We know he's wrong, it's fine, leave it. Well, who then is going to tell the powerful person you are wrong? The entire community needs to tell him, you know what? You are wrong, subhanallah. That is how Islam works. This is what Allah says. If you want mercy, you have to stand up. No matter who is on any side, what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. That is when you will achieve the mercy of Allah. If you're not prepared to do that, don't expect the mercy of Allah. Subhanallah. Have you heard what I've just said? That if someone is wrong, just because they are powerful or in authority, we go to the other side who's slightly weaker and we keep on telling them, don't worry, we know who's right, we know who's wrong, but you see, now never mind, it's okay, it's fine. How long are we going to keep on letting this happen? If that were the case, the rich and powerful will keep on, will keep on oppressing those who are weak. And I'm not saying that everyone who's rich and powerful is actually a tyrant. No, not at all. Subhanallah. It's just by way of example. Because it happens a lot in society and community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us strengthened. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us not to mock at one another. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la yaskhar qawmum min qawmin asa an yakunu khayram minhum. Verse number 11 of the same surah. O you who believe, do not mock at one another. Don't make a joke of one another. Don't insult one another. Subhanallah. Perhaps you don't know who may be better from the two of you. They might be better than you. And you are mocking at them. You are degrading them. For what? And Allah says, the women included. The women included. We should not mock at one another. Insult one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't use vulgar language, insulting, abusive language with one another. And don't call each other derogatory nicknames. You know what's a derogatory nickname? A nickname you have concocted for someone and they don't like that nickname. If someone likes it, it's okay. So if you were to call people fatty, for example, if he likes it, it's not a bad name. But if they don't like it, it's a bad name. I know the men don't mind being called fatty, but I don't think the women mind. Meaning, I think the women actually do mind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. That's just one example that came to my mind right now. But there are so many other examples. You have a name for a person. You call him something. Make sure he likes the name. If he doesn't, change it. Call him with his proper name. Call her with her proper name. Subhanallah. Something they like to be called with. Your name is Ibrahim. 
Instead of calling you Boo, they rather call you Ibrahim in a proper way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. And may Allah make us from those who choose nice names for our children such that people don't just cut them short. You know, if you have a name that takes 16 seconds to actually pronounce, by default, the parents are guilty of having sliced that name <laughs> even before they had named the child because they didn't think subhanallah that nobody's going to say this entire name so keep a good name that which people will pronounce properly that it which is easy i always say we live amongst people who are not arabs they don't know arabic so if you want to keep a name that has tough arabic letters in it strong ones that people are not going to pronounce the ha and the ha and the ha and so on you are going to make it tough for people to call your child Rather use a name that is quite easy for non-Arabs to pronounce, especially when you're living among the non-Arabs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us appreciate the beauty of naming and make us from those who can give good names. I mean, make dua for your parents, by the way. They've named you, alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about these type of names that we shouldn't be naming one another. Then there is a very, very interesting and important uh, lesson by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very important lesson. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Allah says, stop suspecting and doubting. For indeed, a lot of that is very, very sinful. Suspicion and doubt. Allah warns us in Surah Al-Hujurat, save yourself from destroying your marriage, destroying your relationships, destroying your families, destroying your communities by saving yourself from doubting and suspecting. This one did black magic, this one did yellow magic, the other one did that, this one's been doing this, this one's been having an affair, that one's been doing this, and this one I doubt, I suspect, if that's the case, you have a cancer. You have a cancer. You need chemotherapy. May Allah make it easy. I promise you, it is very difficult to help someone who suffers the disease of doubt and suspicion. So Allah says it clearly, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اجْتَنِبُوا كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الظَّنِّ إِنَّ بَعْضَ الظَّنِّ إِثْمٍ O you who believe, stay away from the doubting. Stay away from most of the doubting. For indeed, it is sinful. Now, why does Allah say most of it? Because sometimes if someone says, how's the weather outside? You say, mm, I'm suspecting it's, uh, it's, it's cold, you know. That type of suspicion is fine, <laughs> meaning it's not really suspicion. It's a matter of speaking, speech. So if, if someone says, you know what, what time are they landing? Say, you know what, I, 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 I suspect about 3.30 and you look at your clock. That is fine, that's okay. That's just a type of speech. It's not actually suspicion. But here we are talking about suspicion where you're doubting people and you're doubting the intentions of the people. Amazing. Someone comes and does a good deed and you doubt his intention. Why? For what? Someone comes and does something and you think of the worst thing. Mu'min should think of the best. Someone did something, you think of the best possible reason why they could have done it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Then Allah says, Wala tajassasu, Don't ever spy on one another. Don't ever spy on one another. Why? Have you ever thought of it? Say someone spies on another. Remember, Allah knows the sins we're all involved in. He knows the depth of the sin. He is Ghafoorul Rahim. He will forgive. If you spy on someone, you'll get such a big shock, such a big shock, and you're not Ghafoorul Rahim. And in all honesty, that person could have come out of the sin that they may have perpetrated, that you caught them engaged in. But because you caught them, there was now no forgiveness, no more. The door is closed. Yet, had that perhaps gone through on its own, the person may have come to a lecture or a lesson or some mo motivation, some movement in the right direction. They could have turned to Allah before you ever knew that they committed the sin and they could have become a better person than you. Allah says, watch out, you don't spy. It's us. Everyone owes the answers to us. You don't spy on one another. You don't. Now people sometimes look and say, but why? Why? Well, Allah says, don't. So save yourselves because there is a price you will pay when you spy. There is a price. I recall I was once involved in an arbitration many years back. And a spouse spied on the spouse. I won't say he or she, right? And what happened is the spouse then found so many things against that spouse and decided, I want out. That's it. So the spouse was, subhanallah, divorced, married again. 
Someone who did worse than the first one. And the third time, a person who did worse than the first two. And then this person comes back to me and says, you know what, I should have never spied in the first place. Because I don't know, man is swimming in sin. It's only Allah who can take us out. My brothers and sisters, imagine if people were to know your thoughts. We wouldn't be able to come out of the house. Imagine if people were to look at your eyes and tell what you're thinking and what you've saw, what you've seen whole day and what you've been into. It's between you and Allah. Allah has blessed us by keeping it hidden. Allah has favored us by keeping our thoughts to inside our minds and our brains. That's a gift of Allah. Haven't you thought of it? If you have thought of something haram, the public doesn't need to know it. Allah says, hang on. It's between you and I. Now deal with it. Quickly eradicate it. And you say, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And you carry on, right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So this is a golden piece of advice. La tajassasu. Don't spy. Spying, you pay for it. There is a price you're going to pay. You're going to find out things that will shock you. And shock you in a way that you might even lose your sanity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Then Allah says, Wala ba'dukum ba'da. Do not backbite one another. Don't talk bad about someone behind their backs. This is why I've said a few times in this month, you want to change your life, speak good about people behind their backs. Only good. Anyone. If someone talks bad about them, stop them. Say, look, I know this person has a lot of good. Why don't you talk about the good? If we learn to speak good about others behind their backs, we will solve a lot of our crises. A lot of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to speak good about others behind their backs. You have a problem with someone, address it with them directly. Subhanallah. But otherwise, say nice things, say good things. All of us seated here, we have some goodness in us. Let's find the goodness, look for it, search for it, and talk about it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who can say good things about each other behind our backs. Then Allah reminds us that we all come from the same source. One mother, one father. Verse number 13, Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ O oh people, we have created you from a single male and a female and we have caused a multitude of you to, to disperse thereafter, to spread thereafter. We have made you into various peoples and nations and tribes in order that you recognize one another. That's the reason why we made you different. So that you can recognize one another. For indeed, the closest to Allah is the one or the most honored to Allah is the one who is the most pious. The one who is most conscious of Allah is the one who's closest to Allah. It's got nothing to do with your color, your size, where you come from, your shape, etc. No. Closeness to Allah has to do with whether or not you are conscious of Him. That's what Allah says. And then Allah ends that verse by saying, He is the one who is all-knowing. Alimun khabir. Two types of knowledge. Allah knows absolutely everything. And that is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I pause for a moment to remind you, my brothers and sisters, today, you can recognize me. I can recognize you. I can see you. And mashallah, we have a multitude of colors and sizes and people and mashallah, tabarakallah. Imagine if we were all identical. I've spoken about it a few days ago, right? If we were all identical, life would be boring. So Allah says, we did you a favor. We made you different so that you can recognize each other. Your thumbprint, your iris, everything totally different so that you can be identified. That's all. So do not think that this difference that we have is in order for one to feel that he is superior to another or for one to feel that he is higher than the other in any way whatsoever. No, it is solely and only for recognition purposes and to test you how are you going to handle it in your heart knowing that you come from one mother and one father. You are brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to eradicate racism and to fight it and to ensure that we are from among those who respect all people 
no matter what race they are, no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, we treat them fairly and equally. أقول قولي هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد سبحان الله بحمده سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك.